Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Shauna Meyerson. And she uh talks to she talks about she's a speaker, she's a coach, she's a best-selling author. And for the audience, she's gonna be great for talking about mindfulness. She's a, a yoga practitioner, and I'm really happy to have her on the show. So Shauna, welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your inviting me. Um, I do have to go on record saying is I'm not a best-selling author. In fact, I'm not an author per se. I blog a lot, but I don't think that that translates into sales. Uh, so just that one little correction. Yeah. So, you know, start off by, um, you know, talk about, you know, your background, your, your story, and we'll dive right into it. Okay. Uh, my background is, so I came to yoga on accident. I mean, really quite literally, I came to yoga on accident. I was sort of the consummate athlete and I had an accident. <laughs> I'm not like that kind of accident. I was walking around my apartment and, and I broke my toe. It, it, it wasn't like a super dramatic accident, but it was dramatic enough that I couldn't do the athletic things that I was used to doing. So I was sort of um, coerced by the universe to try this stupid yoga thing. Um, this was, uh, August of 2001, very shortly before 9-11 and uh, a few weeks. And let's just say it was a message that was sent to me from the universe at just the right time. And though I came to it kicking and screaming, um, it spoke to me on such a visceral level that I honestly knew right away, right away that this was something that, I needed to be dedicating myself to, and I'm very highly educated. I'm an Ivy League grad. I was getting my MBA at UCLA at the time. I had a successful career with some very, very large and powerful organizations, and I was like, I'm leaving it all. I want to teach yoga. I want to change the world in that little way, and here I am. That was, that was 22 years, well, 22 and a half years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really uh transformative story. And um, you know, usually you the guests in the audience, they have something and it's it triggers and inspires. So talk about, you know, um, you know, how uh you know what what is it about the practice that you know helps you to uh, improve and ha that helps you to um help clients. Sure. So let me just say, first of all, that the reason why I did leave my career and in a way, my education, it's not really my education, it's my formal education, but honestly, like the path of yoga is an education of itself because it's a life education that never ends. Um, but like the real kernel that made me shift at all was I, I walked into yoga, I, weeks before my my 30th birthday i wasn't like a a very young person and it was the first time in my entire life that anybody ever told me it was okay to fall i mean literally the first time and as a lifelong perfectionist that was such a profound revelation that that was like the driving force that told me more people need to know the secret that we can fall up instead of falling down. And so my teaching, so I have sort of like two very, very, very like polar aspects to my teaching. Um, on one end, I have mini yogis yoga for kids, which is my children's program which I started in March of 2002, way before yoga for kids was a thing. I mean, like decades before it was a thing. Now it's it's ubiquitous. Like you, you can't find a kid that doesn't practice yoga. But in 2002, believe me, what is now ubiquitous back then was ridiculous. So that's like dealing with children, right? As young as two and a half years old. On the other end of the spectrum, I have my yoga athletica practice, which is the most challenging yoga practice you could pos possibly imagine. I mean, lots of handstands, arm balances, contortions, like the stuff of legends, right? And, but honestly, like 
the lesson, the lesson is the same. It doesn't matter where my students are on the continuum. And I work with everybody. I mean, I work with kids who are doing the crazy handstands. I work with adults who want to lie on the floor all day and, and really don't want to do the intense stuff. Like I, I work with it all. Um, but the kernel is the same. And the kernel is learning to accept yourself, learning to accept your process, um, but never getting complacent with it, right? So always pressing your edges, always looking to be better, but at the same time, that weird confluence of I'm always doing my best and I always accept that my best is my best. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I love that. It's kind of like a, the because I'm, you know, it's a, almost like a spiritual practice and, you know, there's also physical benefits. Um, and, sure. Uh, you know, uh, one thing is like, it's really interesting because um, I, you know, you can, you don't realize until you like move your body in certain ways that you're like holding on to like chronic patterns or like your body's like, you know, holding on to these, um, uh, you know, habitual patterns of tension. Um, so uh, what one, one question is, um, because you talked about perfectionist, perfectionism and how um, yoga helped you to let go of that. So how does ego hold us back from our full potential? <laughs> it, it, that That's such an interesting question because um, there's a nuance to that answer that I think most people don't understand. So let's start with the obvious, okay? The obvious is our typical definition of ego, right? And, and the typical man on the street, woman on the street is going to associate ego with egotism, right? Meaning self-absorption, putting yourself ahead of others, et cetera, et cetera. And so most people, when they think of ego with yoga, they think of the person at the front of the class who's doing all the things that nobody else is doing and is like, look at me, I'm amazing. And they're on the, you know, all over social media and they're just so wrapped up in the performance aspect um, which quite frankly is not a real aspect of yoga that was never intended to be a piece of yoga. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this performative and even over sexualization of what is meant to be a very spiritual practice, um, is very egotistically driven. Okay. But here's the flip side that most like just pedestrian humans who just walk into a yoga studio and roll out a mat and roll it up and go home, don't understand, is that the flip side of ego, and when I say flip side, I don't mean the opposite of. I mean, it is the same coin, it's just the other side of the coin, is that when people get overly concerned with their ego, they become afraid to fail because they don't want to look stupid. And so what happens is there's the person who's amazing and can do all the crazy things and they are in the front of the class. But the person who also has an overinflated ego is the one hiding in the back of the class and not even trying because they're afraid of failing mm. Mm. or looking stupid. Yeah. It's interesting. It's just kind of like when you put um one thing that the whole experience, I, I encourage people to, because it's just, but the, the whole experience is like you're hot and sweaty and just like, you know, so many people and it's like, you just actually, you have to drop your, you know, you have to drop your ego, you have to drop your, and just go and then um, it's just, then you have, you know, people that are, um you know, fitter, skinnier, prettier, uh, you know, stronger, but you know, all this, and you just have to let it go and just kind of, you know, and the, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, not being afraid to fall and just kind of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's really interesting. Um, so, um, the other question that I have for you is, um, um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people they're, you know, they're stuck in their jobs or nine to fives or corporate jobs. Um, you know, they've got these right. nice pedigrees and they actually want to do something like you, like, be a yoga teacher or a coach or so how does how do you how do you leave your job and follow your dream what do you tell clients yeah and that's a very very interesting um question because some people really 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 resonate with my response and some people get really pissed about it so so here's my response 
Um, not everybody is meant to do in life that which they love. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so there are hobbies and there are callings. Mm-hmm. And so I think that a lot of hobbyists, and I could say yoga, it doesn't matter. It could be pottery. It could be stamp collecting. It, it doesn't matter what it is. Like they love the doing, right? Um, don't necessarily have the skills or, or even the passion for making it a profession. Okay. So in yoga, we'll say teaching, but if it's stamp collecting, like trading, like I, I'm, I'm not a stamp collector, but I, I do like collect, like, I like tchotchkes, like little things, like, and the thought of like getting that one stamp that's worth a million dollars or whatever and selling it. Right. That's not in every stamp collector's, you know, wheelhouse. Some people just want it, you know, enshrined or in a safe or whatever. So that that's like that example. So in yoga, I think that particularly now, I'm gonna be honest, since the pandemic, the yoga industry has taken a hard pivot towards hard pivot towards free content. What does that mean for a yoga instructor? You better love this or you're in real trouble Uh, because it's not necessarily the huge money making machine that it sort of became, let's say, in the decade leading up to the pandemic, about the 2010, 2012 to maybe 2020 when everything crashed. Um, So in order to take the leap, here's what's interesting. Um, so I used to work in Hollywood in the film industry. I I worked at ICM, which is at the time was number two agency in the world. Now the agency system has gotten a little bit weird, but it's still like top three agencies, if not still probably number two. Um, and why was I there? I was there because I wanted to be a screenwriter. Okay, now, now let me connect the dots. Um In LA, there's this big backdoor policy, right? Of like the old joke is that every waitress in LA is really an actress, right? Trying to wait on the right producer. Of course, now um, that has shifted, honestly, into yoga instructor. But that's just a weird irony of confluence in this conversation. Because the real point of what I was going to say is, Why was I at ICM? Because I wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't willing to give up everything to be a writer. Instead, I'm like, well, what if I go to Hollywood? I work at a at a you know powerful agency. I meet the agents, the producers, the directors, the writers. I meet all the people. Then I got into script development, which for people who don't understand what script development is, it's like what it would be the like analogy to a book editor, meaning you're helping people rewrite. And I'm like. My writing was something I did on the side, right? That I'm like, okay, well, maybe I'll write a screenplay that will hit. But in the meantime, I need to, you know, I need I need to make ends meet, right? And so was that a calling? Listen, I do believe I'm a good writer. Obviously, it wasn't a calling because I wasn't willing to get up, give up everything to do it. When yoga came into my life, it, the, the most simply put way is the that I can explain it is at the time the average yoga instructor was earning something around seventeen thousand dollars a year now keep in mind I had just come out of Microsoft I know I'm leaving out some time in between Hollywood and my my tech career or whatever but I'm like I may shift literally into poverty wages by making this shift And I'm leaving my MBA program, which I just spent an inordinate amount of money on. And and it's my education, you know, like this is important stuff. But it was so, it made so much sense to me that the universe was like, this is just what you need to do. That I was, in retrospect, I'll say I was willing to take the leap, but I could tell you going back into my mind 23 years ago, it didn't feel like a leap. It felt, again, like a calling. So so what I would say to answer your question is not everything you love is your calling. When the call comes, answer it, and you'll know when it comes. 
I hope you'll know when it comes. Yeah, that's very powerful. And I really love that when the, because, you know, and I love this idea because not everybody is, is, is going to have to, you know, follow your path, you know, um, you know, I know, you know, had um, a lot of, uh, you know, pre previous guests, she was a doctor and then her calling was to be a, a, a coach teaching physicians how to, you know, live and travel anywhere and kind of be a, like digital nomad and, but not, you know, not all everybody is supposed to do that, um, which I really love that. And I love this, that quote that you said, when it comes, you knows. Um, so how do you, uh, you know, I think we have around two, three minutes and how can people find you um, and check out your work, um, you know, uh, and maybe sign up for yoga class with you or co coaching call? How do, how do they find out more about you? Yeah, the easiest way to find me, honestly, is on my website, which is Yoga Athletica. And I'll spell it because it's weird. It has only one A in the middle. So it's Y-O-G-A-T-H-L-E-T-I-C-A dot com. Um, all of my social media links, including my mini yogis program, everything is linked there. My handstand breakthrough program is there. And I do teach privately both live in LA and on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting. And I, I know, um, you know, during the pandemic, you know, there was a lot of um, basically, you know, YouTube, you could go to YouTube and a lot of yoga instructors um, doing that. So uh, kudos to you. And um, I really enjoyed this conversation. And for Thank the audience, you. be sure to uh, check out all of um, Shauna's uh, resources. And uh, thanks so much for an enlightening episode. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your inviting me.